A while back, I made a video about my CD-ROM tower, this SCSI storage array that's packed with Nakamichi CD-ROM drives that all have built-in five disc changers. So your PC can access 35 discs automatically with no manual disc swapping. And that video was a lot of fun, I'd like to think, but there was a lot more to that story. The tower was one product among many and a whole market that existed for a brief period in the 90s. I'm not sure if there was a concrete term for these things, but I've been calling them CD-ROM libraries. I have a couple of them on my desk here and probably pictures of some more floating next to me. And these are all similar products in as much as they're ways to access a lot of CDs, but they work in very different ways and they're intended for very different purposes. I'd wanted to cover all this stuff in that first video, but I had to trim it down because I ran into problems. For instance, this is a Pioneer Laser Memory DRM1804X, which I received before I made the first video and I had every intent to use it. Trouble is, I got it, I tested it, it wouldn't read any discs, and when I opened it up to investigate, this fell out into my hand. That's the lens for the laser assembly. You can see that in the background there. So these things are so old, they're literally crumbling to bits. So I got another one, the DRM602X. This turned out to work, but the software for controlling it properly no longer exists, and even if I had it, it's just not very impressive to see in action. As I'll show you later, there's really not that much to look at. And worse, these were just the ones I could actually get. The models I really wanted are pretty much all gone. I seem to have missed the boat. They all finished going in the dumpster a couple years ago. But really, the devices themselves were never as significant as what they were used for. So I've decided to go ahead and cover that story as best I can so I can put all this stuff behind me. Now, I will say I have no firsthand experience with any of this stuff. It only happened for a brief moment in history, and most of what I think I know is inferred from magazine articles and books that weren't very detailed. So please take it all with a grain of salt and check the comments for the people correcting me. But assuming I get any of this right, let's start with the question of why anyone actually wanted huge CD-ROM drives. In that first video, I made up a guy who got so unreasonably annoyed at swapping right. discs while playing video games that he built a machine that could hold dozens of them. When he needed a disc, he'd just pick a virtual drive and a few seconds later, that disc was loaded up and ready to use. That's what CD libraries did. They automated disc management so a person didn't have to lay hands on a drive every time a new disc was needed. But that video was mostly a joke. You'd have to be pretty picky to spend thousands on hardware just to avoid the occasional disc swap, and I doubt many individuals ever bought them. Businesses, on the other hand, had genuine need for accessing tons of CDs. A number of needs, actually. Some of them were obvious, and they actually continue to be relevant almost up to the present day. But in their heyday, CD libraries mostly served one very unique and temporary purpose, for which you have to understand why CD-ROMs themselves were an exciting technology. Oh boy, that thing is so heavy. Yeah. Let's pretend we're in about 1993 to keep things simple. Now, there have been two major changes between then and now in the way we store and deliver data. One is that hard drives have gotten far bigger and cheaper, and the other is that the internet has become ubiquitous and incredibly fast. Since neither of those things was true in 93, it was tough to get or store large amounts of data, and CD-ROM changed that overnight. In an era when the average computer user had never made a file larger than a megabyte, CD-ROMs stored over 600 of them. That's over half a gig at a time when most people never actually heard the word gigabyte. CD-ROMs offered a staggering amount of storage considering the technology they more or less displaced was the floppy disk, which was about 450 times smaller. Trouble is, CD-ROMs didn't replace floppies. Even if we talk about the late stage stuff, like CDRWs with packet writing, they still just didn't really serve the same purpose. There's a lot of explanation behind that, just take my word for it. Nobody ever saw CDs as a true replacement for floppies, especially since you couldn't even buy writable disks in 1993. I mean, enterprises could, but no consumer had that. A CD-ROM was exactly what it said on the tin, read only memory. So I can say that a CD is 400 times bigger than a floppy or three times bigger than a consumer hard drive, and it sounds impressive, but these things don't really compare. The only thing you could actually do with CDs that you couldn't before was to receive massive data dumps from businesses. But that led to a kind of quiet crisis, a decade-long push by software vendors to figure out what the hell to do with this new and incredibly powerful delivery channel because consumers just didn't really have a use for that much data. 
The myth was that CDs would grant access to these incredible resources, whole research libraries, the collected works of Shakespeare and all that nonsense. But in the few cases where this panned out at all, in my experience, it was really just a solution looking for a problem. Software vendors would have you believe there was a CD-ROM revolution, but of all the software I remember from the time, most of it was maybe 10 or 20 megs. Sure, it wouldn't fit on a floppy. You couldn't get close to that on a floppy disk. But it certainly didn't fill a whole CD-ROM, and all the stuff that did pretty much amounted to crappy textbooks. Everyone had that copy of Encarta that came with their PC that they ran once, and there were gobs of other edutainment apps that pretty much consisted of, again, textbooks with the occasional video clip baked in. Very little real increase in educational value, and most people weren't all that interested in owning large quantities of reference materials anyway. You can put a whole encyclopedia on one disc. There is a whole encyclopedia. If there had been CDs with whole libraries on them, I never saw one. If the collected works of Michael Crichton had been available on disc, I would have asked my parents for that. But as far as I know, it never happened. And since the quality of most CD-ROM software was pretty poor on average, if somebody was publishing public domain books or whatever, they were probably pretty unpleasant to read. And even then, books just only take up so much space. I can't imagine any company managing to fill up even half a CD that way. So in the 90s, nobody could shut up about how big CD-ROMs were. The biggest arena of computers today, the biggest arena is in the CD-ROMs. But you had to fill them with something people actually wanted, and that meant video games. The Seventh Guest and Myst were celebrated at their release and for decades afterwards as killer apps for the CD-ROM format. And the reason they made such good use of that much storage is because they were composed entirely of sound and video clips, the only things consumers were interested in that could fill up a whole disc. Uh, later on, this would change, but in my eyes, the consumer CD-ROM revolution that supposedly happened in the early 90s was a marketing stunt. It didn't really change computing all that much. In the business world, however, CDs had a profound impact on how a lot of companies operated right away. In fact, it even made some of them walk back from technology they already had that was ahead of its time. In the 90s, business applications started to get really big. Uh, software development environments, graphics packages, and office suites, to name a few things, were beginning to fill up whole CDs with useful content. If you bought Borland C++ in 1993, you'd find that just the help file was nine and a half megs. That would have spanned seven floppy disks all on its own. In fact, a lot of floppy-based software didn't include built-in documentation at all for that reason. You were expected to just read the paper manual. So this was definitely an improvement. Likewise, office suites could include tons of templates and clip art that would have previously sold as a separate product since it didn't make sense to ship an extra 15 floppy disks for media most people would never need. So these were benefits for everyone. But then there were product categories that were only useful to businesses and only really practical thanks to CD-ROM. Content libraries are a great example. That's stuff like stock photos and clip art that are taken for granted now since we can just grab them off Google Images or Shutterstock if we're planning on selling anything. But in 1993, print quality images would have cost a fortune to download. So companies bought products like the Corel Professional Photos Collection. Uh, this one, uploaded to Internet Archive, consists of photos in categories like India, fruits and vegetables, and wolves, spanning nearly 200 CDs. It's as if you have 300 huge file cabinets. That's over 100 gigs of photos. Downloading that would have been, in no uncertain terms, impossible, let alone storing it. In 93, you could barely buy a one gig hard drive at all, and you'd need 100 of them to store all that material. So a graphic design shop would have found this product invaluable. Another example is sound effects. Uh, famously, almost every sound in the game Doom came from a single collection called Sound Ideas that Bobby Prince just bought off the shelf. Specifically, Sound Ideas 6000, which was an enormous collection spanning 40 discs. I don't know if those were plain CD audio or WAV files, but they would have been basically identical in size since audio compression wasn't very common at the time. So this collection would have been about 25 gigs. Again, that would have been more storage than every single machine at id Software in 1993 combined. There are plenty more products in this vein. You can flip through the back of any magazine of the era and find ads for similar things, and they were still being sold well up into the 2000s. Uh, this here, ClickArt 950,000, uh, is presumably nearly a million images. 
This was sold in 2004 and it spans a whole grip of CDs. I think there's a five or eight in here. What do we got? What do we got? Disc, 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 disc. Five, six, seven, seven discs. Now, these ones are ostensibly for non-commercial purposes, so I guess office memos, greeting cards, whatever, but uh, the point is that uh, even a decade later, it was still hard to get large amounts of high quality imagery online, so this sort of product was a priceless resource for creative businesses. I'm glad I bought this. I needed a good, like, physical bit. You know how much I hate doing videos without any props? Oh, yeah. It just kills me. But there was yet another kind of CD-ROM product that was also very important, but only really made sense to large businesses, and that was data. Yeah, I know, I just described a whole bunch of that, but I'm using this word in a very specific way. Think about a typical office job, you know, the sort that isn't entirely about computers. They do exist. Imagine being an insurance adjuster, a lawyer, or a city planner. For any of those, you need access to tons of information. The adjuster needs actuarial tables. The lawyer needs case law and statute. The planner needs historical rainfall figures and topological maps. Then, as now, there were companies that maintained these huge pools of raw data. It was the original meaning of the term database, just a gigantic pile of collected facts. There have been services going back centuries that aggregated this kind of info and made it available in all kinds of forms. Like uh, in the 60s, you'd go to the library and find some enormous paper tome with rainfall figures for every US zip code going back 120 years, cross-referenced with pollution estimates, that kind of thing. This was a big business for eons, and it still is. Of course, nowadays, you'd get it all online. If you're a lawyer and you need to know about eminent domain, you go to the website for Westlaw or LexisNexis. You type in whatever you want, and the server spits back a list of articles sorted by relevance, age, whatever. But in 1993, okay, well, in this specific example, you'd actually do the exact same thing, and probably in 83 or 73 as well. This is a favorite topic of mine. The two companies I just named, Westlaw and LexisNexis, uh, have basically a monopoly on legal information. They were launched in 1975 and 73, respectively, and right from the get-go, they offered online access to their libraries. You could set up a terminal at your law office that connected to their system, at first over dedicated leased lines or dial-up, then over the early wide area networks like TimeNet, and finally over the internet. They had a query interface that could whittle down millions of records to just the specific ones you needed, just like we expect now. Only it was 50 years ago, when most people had never seen or heard of anything like this. Not even a library index terminal. So that's a fun tangent, but it's also relevant, because it means that by 1993, the concept of an online searchable database was very old hat. I'm sure companies in other fields offered similar services. If you needed weather data, you could either get a link up to the NWS or probably some company that aggregated their info. But as you can imagine, online access of any kind cost a ton at the time. Internet connections weren't yet universal, even for big businesses, and the cost of connecting to any network service was substantial, to put it mildly. Things got even worse if the resources you needed were pictures or raw scientific data, DNA structures, precision, USGS maps, that kind of stuff could add up to hundreds of megs, which would have choked out even a T1. And on the provider side, they'd have needed enormous pipes to serve it all up. So if a business couldn't pull this stuff over the wire, then the only way to query it would be to have the whole thing on hand. But for a law library or geological survey data, that could be gigabytes in an era when a gig was still an incredible amount of storage. Consider that in 1993, a typical hard drive was none gigs. If you bought a consumer PC, it probably had between 80 and 600 megs of storage. Larger drives existed, but they cost nearly a buck a meg, so 1.7 gigs ran around $1,400. In a world where a 500 meg hard drive was pretty damn big and only the largest enterprises could afford a 1.5 megabit internet connection, imagine what a single CD represented. More storage than a whole workstation on a disc that cost almost nothing to make. So imagine if it was 2005, uh, you have a 120 gig hard drive in your PC and a five megabit internet connection, and now someone hands you a half terabyte SD card. Downloading that much data would take three weeks and then you'd have nowhere to put it but just plug in this little tiny chip and you have it all right away. It would have blown your mind. CD-ROMs were no different. 
And what we're talking about here is the long enduring secret weapon of mass data transfer, sneaker net. Even my gigabit internet, which I'm lucky enough to have at home, doesn't compare to a van full of hard drives doing 70 on the freeway. And in 1993, the joke was the same, except you'd say that a T3 didn't compare to a FedEx envelope full of CD-ROMs. CDs also took up less space and used less power than hard drives. They were easier to maintain and manage, they didn't wear out, and they were virtually impossible to damage unless you acted like a dumbass. You can't head crash a CD-ROM drive, and if it dies, you just take the disk out and put it in another drive. You don't even need a clean room to do it. Plus, you only need a one-time investment rather than a hard drive that has to be replaced periodically or a network service that costs money every day whether you use it or not. So for all these reasons, even if those database providers had online services, they also began offering programs where you could pay, probably thousands of dollars a month, to receive regular shipments of CDs with their latest data. And that was really appealing. So much so that some of those companies that had direct connections to data services in the 70s and 80s were working with them exactly the way we do now with the internet actually abandoned those direct connections when CD-ROMs became available because having the data on hand cost a lot less and was a lot more convenient. In fact, even if you're as young as I am, you might remember one of these services, the Microsoft Developer Network, or MSDN. It's just a website nowadays, but it used to be a series of CDs full of the latest Windows APIs, documentation, and software delivered to developers on a regular schedule. And that service still existed up until fairly recently. And thus, you can see that our notional 1993 office might have owned a lot of CDs. Uh, Suppose this is a pretty big company we're talking about here with fingers and a lot of pies. They might have had all these things at once. Stock photos, graphics apps, software development suites, MSDN, one or more databases, and any of those could have been a multi-disc set. That Corel library was probably an outlier at 200 disks, but even Westlaw might have been a dozen. Although, this is where we run into the really big problem with this story. I don't know how big these sets really were, because as far as I can tell, they're all gone. I get the impression that companies sometimes had whole boxes of these things shipped quarterly or even monthly, so there should be tens of thousands of them out there, but I've never found any. I've never even seen a picture of a Westlaw CD. My assumption is that very few people with access to this stuff would have had any desire to take it home. What lawyer was going to walk out with a crate under their arm full of superseded case law? But I also suspect that the terms of the subscriptions required the discs to be returned or destroyed so they couldn't get smuggled out and sold at a lower price to people who didn't need the most up-to-date info or didn't even know they were being scammed. So my guess is that all these discs got shredded long ago and that's why I've never found one, at least until last year. When I bought my second EduQuest machine, it arrived with a disc in the drive and it was sort of the thing I'd been looking for. It's not a huge library like I hoped, but it's a good example. I've since lost that disc, so I don't have it hold up for the camera, but I uploaded it to Internet Archive before I lost it, so here's that PNG. This is NewsBank Science Source, a database of scientific papers and uh, actually a surprisingly late edition. It was published in mid-99, although it has data all the way back to September 87. And this really is a great example because I can see exactly how it would have been useful in its day. Uh, here's the software. It runs under DOS. It's a pretty simple interface. If you were a researcher who needed to find out as much as you could about bees, you could type in bees. And there you go. Dates and names of 87 papers about bees. You could also narrow your search to, say, only papers that mention bees and pollination. There, 17 papers. And then for each one, you can see the publication it appeared in and when it was published, as well as who wrote it, and in most cases, a summary of the article. I'm not sure if this is verbatim or if it's been abridged. I suspect the latter. Nowadays, of course, we would expect a lot more. The complete article in PDF format with images and the original layout, but at the time, that probably wasn't practical. For one thing, before digital distribution had really been taken into full account by IP law, it probably would have been very hard to license this sort of thing. But also, most PCs had very limited graphics capability, and since just the digests take up 130 megs, we can guess the full text, let alone images, would have far exceeded one disk. And that's pretty cool, because this does actually challenge the yawning vastness of the CD-ROM format. I mean, imagine having this in 93. 
Despite not having internet access, you could still filter through tens of thousands of articles from the comfort of your office. You'd still have to go to the library eventually, but you wouldn't have to get out of your seat until you had a printout of exactly what you were looking for in hand. Compare that to pulling out every copy of every periodical going back a decade and skimming every article by hand, or flipping through print digests page by page, searching for keywords and making notes for hours on end. This CD would have been career altering. So having labored the point, we can all agree that CD-ROMs were probably a godsend for businesses, but once you had the discs, you had to give all your employees access, and that was complicated. You could, of course, just pass them around as needed. If everyone had a CD-ROM drive, that'd work well enough if you had 20 employees, at least until Jeff went on vacation and left the MSDN collection locked in his office. But with 200 employees or 1,000, it would be untenable. If you've worked in corporate IT, you probably know how miserable it can be to get a new workstation loaded up. You need Windows, Microsoft Office, antivirus, internal tools, all that stuff. Nowadays, just about everyone uses disk imaging, but I'm pretty sure that wasn't in vogue yet by 93. So instead, you'd have to load all that stuff from original media, one disk at a time. Maybe an enterprise buys two or three or even 10 copies of Visual Studio, but in a really big office, those could all be in use at once, loading machines all over campus, or they could be forgotten in some desk drawer. So even with a dozen copies, you might not be able to find one when you need it. And what if someone scratches or breaks a disk now you're out 800 bucks. These days, you could just copy all the disks onto a hard drive and share it on the network. And that was technically feasible in 93, but cost prohibitive. Even servers were using drives of only a gigabyte or two, and just a couple CDs could fill that space up. So the disks themselves had to be made available on the network directly, and this is where CD libraries come in. If you had something like my SCSI tower, you could plug that into a Novell or a Windows NT file server, share all those drives, and then go to any PC on the network and select one, and your request will get directed to the right disk in the right drive. If that disk isn't loaded, then the drive locates it and racks it up, and bam, now you can access any of your install media from anywhere on the network. That way, disks don't need to walk around the office and get lost and scratched and broken. They can all be locked up inside this machine in a secure closet and still available to everyone. It's a great solution, and I've spoken to people who confirmed that that's exactly how these were used. But this tower is an odd specimen compared to most. There were two major types of CD libraries meant for addressing two very different problems. In scenario number one, you have a lot of CDs, maybe dozens or even hundreds, but you only need to access any given disk once in a long while. Uh, for instance, uh, that Corel photo library, that sure is a lot of disks, but you're only gonna need a couple photos from any one of those in any given moment. If you've got a couple artists working on a magazine or whatever, they're not likely to need hundreds of photos from all over the place very quickly. It's more likely to be a couple pictures from one disk, then a couple pictures from another one, and then a long gap while they lay out text and vector art and whatnot. If that's your situation, then you need solution number one, a CD jukebox. Just like the music machines, a jukebox contains one or more actual disk readers, and then it has storage for a much larger number of disks. When you request a disk, a robot selects it from storage and puts it in a drive, very much like the tape robot from Hackers, a real thing that did in fact get used at TV stations. This kind of mechanism can't access a lot of disks simultaneously, but it can select a couple at a time from a potentially enormous library. This is a concept known as near-line storage, kind of a funky word because it sits in between two existing storage solutions. Online storage, where all your data is available at all times, uh, like when you have a bunch of hard drives that are constantly running, and offline storage, which is like tape backups, where you have data sitting in a banker's box in a closet and you can't access it unless someone physically retrieves it and puts it in a drive. Online storage is sometimes important, but it wastes power and maintenance if you don't need to access all your data at all times. The banker's box, on the other hand, is inconvenient if you don't know exactly what you're looking for or need to get to something in the middle of the night when the closet's locked up. Nearline storage splits the difference. Rarely used files aren't available instantly, but they can become available pretty fast without any human intervention. You just have to wait for the robot. Okay, now, scenario number two. You have a small number of disks but you need to access them all the time with minimal delay. Or maybe you do have a ton of disks and you need to access all of those all the time with no delay and you have a lot of money. That's where the second type of library comes in. Uh, this doesn't really have a name as far as I can tell. They're basically just a bunch of CD-ROMs in a server. There's no special mechanisms, just ordinary CD-ROM drives, but the idea is you dedicate one drive to each CD for as many disks as you need available at once. 
This is essentially online storage. There's no switching delay when you access data because everything's always mounted. Compared to hard drive arrays though, these cost a lot less and they don't use as much power even when they're running. And in fact, they don't even need to run all the time. Hard drives can be spun down when idle, but my understanding is that data centers never do this because it induces more wear and tear than just leaving them running. So for decades, enterprises have had hundreds or thousands of continuously spinning hard drives eating up kilowatts of power all day and night. Nowadays, of course, SSDs have massively reduced that energy footprint, but that wasn't possible until just a few years ago. So while huge arrays of CD-ROMs might seem a little silly, they probably conferred enormous cost savings, both in media and power consumption. That said, this idea is just put a bunch of CD-ROMs in a server. It doesn't seem all that special. But even the largest servers of the time, and believe me, they were bigger back then, could only accommodate one or two drives. So manufacturers had to make special chassis and some companies sold whole pre-assembled systems with a bunch of drives, sometimes 50 or more, sometimes even a pre-configured server, all as a package deal. Bringing this guy back again, the SCSI tower is actually one of those products. The manufacturer, MDI, built these cases and sold them with a whole bunch of configurations. Uh, there were models with just plain single disk drives, uh, and then they had stuff all the way up to this setup with all the Nakamichi changers. This is an interesting hybrid between the two types of library. It's sort of like RAID 1 plus 0. It has a bunch of independent drives, but then each one is a mini jukebox. So instead of offering just one or two disks from a pool of hundreds, or seven fixed disks at once, this presents any seven disks out of a pool of 35. You can see how this could be a useful in-between option. Of course, it's also kind of weird because it's not really a pool of 35, is it? It's seven pools of five each. A disk can only be loaded by the drive it's in. So if seven employees happen to pick disks that are all in different drives, you're fine. But if two people try to pick disks in the same drive, who wins? Well, that's a big subject and we'll talk more about it in a bit, but first, let's take a closer look at how the usual jukebox machines worked. I showed off the mechanism inside those little Nakamichi 5 disc changers in the last video, so you can watch that if you want all the details. They were pretty awesome though, especially given their compactness and simplicity. What I have here, however, are two much older models from Pioneer. In fact, I think they're some of the earliest jukeboxes ever made. And before we get into it, I want you to just take a look at these. Most jukeboxes were bought by businesses, right? So if you look at the other products in the market, they're, you know, powder-coated steel with panel gaps everywhere. They're often rack-mounted. It's very industrial stuff. You wouldn't put it in your home. Nerds wouldn't admire the look or the footprint, but these definitely weren't intended as consumer products. These machines, however, kind of look like they were. They've got nice bezels, they've got screen printing. They're clearly meant to look good sitting on a desk and they'd almost work in like an AV system. They're nice looking devices. Despite my claims that jukeboxes just weren't for individuals, I think Pioneer imagined that someone might buy these to use at home. And I think it made sense, at least for the right person. So let's start with the smaller model. This is the DRM602X. It cost around $1,300 in 1994, and it's an upgraded version of the DRM600, which came out all the way back in 1991. So I'm gonna presume Pioneer was selling something in between those in 93. I do kind of wish I had a 600 because I think it might have been the first jukebox ever sold, at least the first one that wasn't some proprietary bespoke system, you know, just a normal product you could buy and plug in. In concept, this machine is actually very similar to the Nakamichi's. It takes six discs instead of five. You can see the cute little six disc logo on the front here. Love that little touch. It's also much larger, of course, but it does the same stuff and in much the same way as you'll see. This, of course, connects via SCSI, like most storage devices at the time. Those are these gigantic 50-pin ports on the back. Uh, you just plug a cable into those and then into the back of your PC, and you're done. It doesn't need any drivers because this plays a fun little trick on your computer. You can actually see it during boot. When the SCSI controller looks for connected devices, it sees what looks like six separate CD-ROM drives. This is using a multi-LUN technique that I talked about in the previous video. You should watch that one if you want more details. But basically, this plays a shell game with your operating system. Once your PC starts up, whether you have DOS, Windows, Linux, or anything else, the unit shows up as six separate CD-ROMs. You can see all these drives just show up in Explorer. But let's take a look inside this thing. If I lift up the logic board, you'll see there's just one physical CD transport right in the center. 
it's tough to see what's going on since everything's so dense inside. But if I select a drive in Windows, the transport moves itself up or down to line up with a slot in the disk storage on the right. Then the crank arm slides a disk into the reader, which spins it up like normal, and bam, there's our files. If I then click on another drive, however, the machine unloads the first disk, puts it back into storage, moves the carriage, and pulls in another. In other words, this thing is kiting checks. It pretends to be multiple drives, and when the OS tries to read a disk in a drive that's not actually loaded yet, the jukebox just pretends that that drive is taking a really long time to spin up to cover the little white lie it's telling. Like most lies, this one will come back to haunt it, but we'll get to that. So ultimately, this just simulates a human hand swapping disks in a single CD-ROM drive, and that's how all jukeboxes work. Uh, this one, like I said, functions pretty much like the Nakamichi's, they just hadn't yet had time to miniaturize the mechanism. That said, I don't really understand why the actual CD transport looks as primitive as it does. I mean, this thing is barbarian even for 1994. There's a huge solenoid that locks the laser carriage in place when it's powered off. No idea why they needed that. There's also these enormous linear actuator coils on either side of the reader. They seem a lot bigger than they needed to be. I mean, there were already tiny CD-ROMs by this point. Uh, the Discman was out, so I'm not sure why they built this one in such a caveman style. It looks like it's from the 70s, but let's move on. Now, this stores discs in these six-disc magazines, and that's a pretty cool feature. Most CD jukeboxes ended up being big towers with a bunch of slots inside that you couldn't see or touch directly. Instead, there was a port at the top of the front panel, often referred to as a mail slot, and discs had to be inserted or ejected one at a time through that slot, sort of like a Civil War revolver. With the Pioneer, you just put your discs in this cartridge and shove them in the front six at a time. This is neat, but I'm pretty sure Pioneer did it this way because they were already making six disc changers for home and automotive use that used the exact same trays. And they do have their downsides. Once you have one of these cartridges out, to get to the discs, you have to flip out individual trays using these little tiny nubs on the side here. And there's an interlock so you can only do one at a time. So to load this mag, we flip out the first tray, put in a disc, swing it in, pop out the second one, load the next disc, and so on. Again, kind of like a Civil War revolver. It's a little unsettling too because you have to load the discs with the label side down, the opposite of every other CD player ever made. And you can't just glance through and see what's in a magazine. You have to pick at these little tiny nubs to get each tray to open, then pull the disc out without touching the surface and flip it over to see what it is. Of course, they did include label areas on the cartridges to make this a little easier, and for what it's worth, unloading is a lot more fun than loading. And you know, this is all still quicker than the Nakamichi changer or any kind of mail slot type jukebox, so I can hardly complain. And more importantly, you can buy a bunch of these magazines, preload them, and then swap out a whole pack at a time. And that's super cool. Suppose you're a software developer. You could have a magazine loaded with a bunch of programming resources, your MSDN library, your code samples, that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, when you're ready to relax, you just pop one cartridge out and slam in a new one filled with video games. Or, if you wanted, music. Like most CD-ROMs, this can play audio. There's a headphone jack on the front and even a pair of RCAs on the back, so you could hook this up to your stereo and at the end of the day, just pop in a pack of your favorite albums and relax, without even having to walk over to the living room. So, maybe Pioneer was imagining this being used in the home. Or maybe they were just throwing spaghetti at the wall since nobody else was selling anything like this. It was a completely new product. They didn't know what it was gonna get used for. Maybe they thought it would get used for background music in malls or broadcast automation at radio stations. Or maybe they just already had a CD player mechanism for home and car use. So they figured why take out the audio part? It's already there. Uh, and to that end, you'll notice there are no controls on here. There's no buttons except eject and power, and no IR window for a remote control. The machine has nothing anywhere on it except the audio jacks and the SCSI ports. It's meant to be operated entirely from software, so I figure they weren't too focused on the home listening experience. That said, it is pretty straightforward to do it this way. In Windows, you could just open your CD player app, pick a drive, and hit play. And then if you want to change disks, you just switch virtual drives, the jukebox unloads one disk, puts in another, and away you go. Thank you. 
This is honestly incredibly slick. The other jukebox I have is not so much. The DRM-1804X is clearly a much larger unit, and it actually didn't come out until 1994, but we'll let that slide. This retailed for about $2,500, and it accepts three magazines for an 18-disc capacity. To put this in perspective, again, a review described this as 10 gigabytes of storage, which was an inconceivable number at the time. NASA apparently owned this machine at some point, which is almost cool, but otherwise it doesn't look too exciting. It's just like an overgrown version of the 602. It's got three slots, but otherwise all the same stuff. It's got the headphone jack, eject buttons, and on the back we've got SCSI ports and RCAs. So it looks like it's just a big version of the 602, but it works very differently. First off, as you can see, there's only two devices showing up during boot. There's also only one drive showing up in Explorer. The other one is my built-in IDE drive. Device Manager only shows one SCSI CD-ROM, and if we try to click that icon in Explorer, it says there's no disk in the drive. But wait, didn't we just put 18 disks in the drive? Well, to access those, we would have to operate the changer. The other systems I've shown you inferred what you wanted them to do based on which virtual drive you picked, but there were problems with that approach. To give you an idea, when I power up my PC with the SCSI tower attached, it adds an extra five minutes to the boot process as it goes through and checks which disks are in the trays. The same thing happens if you hit refresh in Windows Explorer, and there were even more issues that, once again, we'll come back to. I promise. I'm getting to that part. But most industrial jukeboxes, including this one, avoid all those potential problems because they expect you to be explicit about everything. The actual reader in this machine is just a plain old CD-ROM. If there's a disk in it, it'll read it. If not, it just says it's empty because it is. To load a disk, you're expected to use special software to talk to the robot mechanism, which they call the changer, and tell it explicitly what you want it to do. Of course, that special software is gone, long gone. Windows had built-in support for this at some point, but these drives are too old for it to work, and the official tools are lost to time. Nobody has cared about these things in 30 years. So the only utility that seems to survive from this whole industry is an open source thing called MTX, which is actually intended for tape libraries, which is a whole different subject. And I had that working at one point, but I can't get it to function anymore. And fortunately that's moot because like I said, this unit doesn't actually work. The laser assembly fell apart, so it can't read anything, and since I figured it was probably trashed anyway, I tried to fix it on the principle of what am I going to do, break it worse, uh, but no dice. I used some very weak glue to tack the lens back into the cavity, but it still won't read anything. It does try. It pulls a disc into the reader. It moves the lens. It fires the laser. It spins up the disc, but after a second, it just gives up, waits, and repeats. So very probably this will never read a disc again. I do have a little footage from back when I had the software working, and you can see that the loading mechanism functions, but it's almost as dense inside as the 602, so it's tough to see what's really going on. It does the same basic routine, though. It pulls a disk out of a slot, puts it in the reader, or it takes it off the reader and puts it in a slot. We can imagine the end user software would have been a little text mode utility that asks which disk you want and then loads it up, or a Windows app that does the same thing with some buttons. You know, We're probably not missing out on much there. The concepts here are pretty straightforward. I really wish I could have demoed one of the more serious industrial ones that came out later, but what can you do? It's hard to find good pictures of most of those things, but I did find an old German eBay listing for one that really makes my point. This is the Pioneer DRM 5004X. Now, if the 602 took six disks and the 1804 takes 18, then you'd think this one takes 50, but instead it takes 500. It's as if you have 300 huge file cabinets. Again, for perspective, that's about 318 gigs, although I'm not sure when this one came out, so maybe that wasn't as impressive. But at any rate, it's built more like most CD jukeboxes were. It still uses magazines, but instead of six discs per, they take 100. I think it's 50 on either side, and there's a vertically traveling swing arm that picks discs from the slots to put into the readers at the bottom. This is really cool, and it gives you a much better idea how the average enterprise jukebox worked, but it also gives you an idea how logistically challenging this could be. Told you, I told you, told you we were gonna talk about the problems. It's time to talk about the problems. The purpose of a machine like this would certainly have been to share a library of disks with a whole network, but that means potentially lots of concurrent users, and in that situation, you couldn't just expose all 500 disks as network shares and let the OS sort it all out because it wouldn't. 
I suggested that you could load your whole 200 disc Corel photo library into one of these things, and you could with plenty of room to spare, but there's only actually two drives in there. So what if your artists need a lot of images? When you only have one or two real drives and then three users ask for different disks, well, there aren't enough drives to service all those requests. Someone has to lose. This is a problem. And if you have a lot of users all asking for different disks, there's gonna be a lot more losers than winners and that's an even bigger problem. If you were very lucky, this might've been tolerable. If you knew the usage patterns of your data somehow, you could maybe load up your disks strategically. For instance, I accidentally made a, a good contrived example in the last video. I loaded all my Riven disks into one drive so I wouldn't have to swap them. But lots of people pointed out that if I'd spread the disks across five separate drives, I could have avoided swapping even inside the changers. All five could have been available simultaneously. That wouldn't have been as funny, I think, but it was definitely the ideal solution. Maybe in some environments this sort of strategizing was feasible, but I doubt you could really predict this sort of thing across dozens or hundreds of employees and disks. So that left you in some real trouble. Users would be constantly asking your jukebox to service incompatible requests. In the worst case, you ran into something that I've seen called changer thrashing. That happens if multiple users are trying to access data when the server doesn't understand that that data is coming from a jukebox. See, from the perspective of a typical OS, CDs are just generic mass storage, what we call block devices. That means when a process asks for a file, it requests it as a series of blocks. If user one asks for a block from disk one, then the server asks the drive to get it, and if the disk is already loaded, it just reads it and spits it back. If user one asks for the next block, it then reads that as well. But suppose instead that after block one, user two shows up and asks for a block from disk two. The server will now ask the drive to get that, so the jukebox proceeds to switch disks, spin up the new one, and retrieve the data, and while all that's happening, user number one is stuck, waiting for their next block of data. If the server doesn't understand how this is all working behind the scenes, it might just put user one's request right in the queue. So user two finishes their read, the drive switches, gets a block from user one, and user two is now waiting again, so it switches back, reads one block, and so on and so forth. Ron Burgundy will read whatever's on his teleprompter. So if the server just blindly asks for data from two disks simultaneously, the jukebox is gonna have to switch back and forth between them over and over, only reading one little tiny chunk of data every time, and that swap takes eight to 10 seconds. So both users are gonna see a transfer rate of essentially zero. To test this, I plugged in the 35 disk tower and uh, the results were much worse than I expected. If I just go in and click on a drive, the Nakamichi mounts the disk like normal. This is copying at full 16 times speed, but what if I now start a copy from a second drive? Yeah, this is bad. The Nakamichi is thrashing. Windows thinks these are two separate physical drives that can be read simultaneously. The changer has painted itself into a corner. By telling its little white lies about how it works inside, it's now helpless to refuse the OS's absurd requests. SCSI doesn't have a verb for, wait, these instructions are stupid. So it's condemned to do this for hours and hours until the mechanism fails. In fact, let me be honest with you. I've been telling some fibs in both the first video and this one. Windows hates these drives. Oh, oh, it hates them so much. This is the Ludovico technique for operating systems. I shit you not, I felt morally dirty making Windows do these things. It really doesn't understand what's going on and it keeps doing crap like trying to query the contents of all 35 disks at once, which as far as I can tell, makes the whole thing lock up. The drives will try to read one disk then switch to another and then all the lights on front of all the drives will flash, all activity stops. I think it's actually confusing the drive so badly that it's resetting the SCSI bus or, or maybe even and crashing the firmware. And while all this is going on, Explorer is completely hung. And then every time a drive comes back with a little bit of data, it just immediately attempts to query some other bit of minutia about the disk and the whole process starts all over again. I've seen Windows blue screen in this situation. I've seen it take over 20 minutes to boot because it has to go through a dozen of these cycles. And I've even seen it return outright incorrect results. Like when I tried it under NT4 and it just said all the drives were unreadable. Now, much of this is due to these specific drives and their little joker's trick that they're playing on the OS. It can hardly be blamed for not understanding the chaos that it's inducing, but even if these had manual jukebox mechanisms, 
how would Windows know not to honor any given request to switch disks? This is bad enough on one PC. What about a network server? What if 50 users go in and click on 50 disks in the same jukebox? What if two users try to access different parts of one CD at the same time? Is it gonna read one block from one track then seek to the other, read one block and repeat so they just get a couple kilobytes per second? This is a mess. Surely these are not acceptable answers. This has to be arbitrated. Well, apparently it wasn't necessarily. The earliest review I found of the Pioneer 1804 describes this phenomenon. It says that two users trying to use the same drive would drop the effective transfer to almost nothing since it spent all its time seeking. There's no solution proposed here. It just says it's not a great idea and leaves it at that. This is a catastrophic outcome. You'd think nothing would have been shipped until they solved this. And obviously there were solutions. Unfortunately, I can't find clear answers on how they all worked. Okay, I just had to stop shooting because my girlfriend stopped me and said I'd unlocked a memory. When she was in school, circa 97, 98, all the kids would file into the computer lab and they'd sit down to look at some stuff in Encarta and they'd be told, okay, everybody in row one, mount the network share and start Encarta. And then once they got to the article everyone was supposed to be looking at, they'd tell them to stop and then the next row of kids could go in, open the same disc and load the same thing so that they all weren't hitting the same CD at once really funny to me that I didn't even have to wait for the comments to come back on this video to confirm this narrative. I'll mix that in somewhere. Thank you. In short, however, CD libraries were always expected to be used with some kind of specialized management software. One such program was SCSI Express, made by the people who built my CD tower. The most detailed review I found was from 97, but they were making it in 93, and I get the impression it was largely the same. As I understand it, this would index all the disks in your jukebox itself in software, then cache their file listings and expose them as virtual directories, which you could then share on the network, so the OS wouldn't have to worry about all the metadata stuff. When a user accessed a directory, nothing would happen until they tried to read a file, and only then would the software tell the jukebox to load up the appropriate disk. This mitigates the issue right off the top by eliminating thrashing from users just looking through the library for a file they want. Another feature that was at least there by 97 was disk caching. SCSI Express would let you add a hard drive that would store copies of recently accessed files. Again, this wouldn't completely cure the problem, but if you had a few disks that were being used heavily, it was likely they'd be in the cache, and any requests would just go to the hard drive. It's not a total solution, but it gets you closer without the expense of a full-size hard drive array. Another solution could have been scheduling, which apparently did happen, although I couldn't find any explanation of how it worked. The way I picture it, instead of handling things block by block, the software could have managed access in terms of sessions. Uh, suppose user one starts reading a file off a disk and then user two requests one from another. The software could ensure that user one gets to copy one whole file or at least a couple megabytes worth or at least 30 seconds worth before it puts that transaction on hold and lets user two get some time. This would again not solve the problem completely but it would go a long way. PC Magazine reviewed several CD server packages and described the existence of scheduling algorithms. Didn't explain how any of them worked. Apparently they struggled with the problem, but SCSI Express scored the highest marks for throughput, so I really wish I could find a copy. I did find documentation for a Linux-based CD server package, uh, which I might be able to find. It supposedly offered quota management to address this problem, but I couldn't find any explanation of how that worked either. So. This is all shrouded by the fog of time. There don't seem to be great answers, at least for me, but I think we get the general outline. As cool as these systems were in theory, they had some intrinsic problems. I don't really know what you could safely put in a 500 disc changer that wouldn't get beat to death by a huge pool of users. The best use case I could think of would be cold storage, archival data that you know will be accessed so rarely that no two people are likely to hit it at once, but you want it readily available when needed. Uh, business records, for instance, back taxes, old invoices, contracts, stuff like that. You might be legally mandated to keep on file for years, and maybe you never use any of it, but you want it there right away if you need it. And that brings us to another factor in the world of business CD-ROM, burners. They existed in 93, businesses could afford them, and they definitely played a role here. Backing up data is a tremendous pain. It was then, it still is now. There's a whole subreddit dedicated to people trying to figure out how to store lots of data without constant effort to keep it alive. And the general consensus is, you can't, don't try. 
Everything rots, everything degrades. Burned CDs, tapes, powered down hard drives, SSDs, they all die even if they're sitting in a cool dark place. Your best bet is to buy huge spinning disks, put them in RAID arrays, monitor them, and be ready to replace them when, not if, they stop working and nobody has found a truly superior solution. No, don't bring up tape, we're not having that discussion. The options were even more limited in 93 than they are now, but CDRs were available, and I've heard, although I can't confirm, that manufacturers at the time claimed they could last hundreds of years. And even if you didn't buy the longevity story, archiving the CDR still had a lot going for it. 650 megs might be all the data your company could produce in a year. A burner cost about $4,000, that was a pittance for any corporation, and it'd produce a disk that was immune to both magnetic fields and head crashes. The possibility of the data layer falling off or being eaten by mold was distant enough, if it was even known at all, for the math to make sense. If you were that worried about it, you could spend another 10 bucks and burn a second disk. But of course, that would mean that every year or every month, you'd have another disk or two to add to the pile, and they would just pile up over time. This was true for backup tapes too, but you'd usually send those off to be stored in some cave or whatever, and who cares if you have 20 or 200 if you have to go get a courier to retrieve them anyway. A 500 disc CD jukebox, on the other hand, could hold 40 years of monthly backups in a pretty small space while still letting you access anyone at the drop of a hat. That was unparalleled in a few ways, and I guess it's what a lot of these things got used for. But even for that purpose, there were actually other solutions already, using formats that consumers never even heard of. For one thing, there was a whole galaxy of technologies called WORM, or Write Once, Read Many. These weren't necessarily CDs. I mean, maybe some were, I'm not really sure. I, I think all the technologies were proprietary, and there were like 15 different competing formats, and I haven't really seen documentation on how any of them worked. Uh, but then on top of all of that, there was Magneto Optical. The MO format was pretty far ahead of its time. It stored several hundred megs on a disc very similar to a CD in form factor, but with very different technology, so closer to the way that mini discs worked. It was also really old. It hit the market in about 1986. Now, these never really stopped being cost prohibitive for consumers, but businesses used them for ages. The original Next Workstation, for instance, shipped with one in 1988. The earlier ones were just another kind of worm technology, but by the early 90s, before the CDRW even existed, rewritable MO discs were available in sizes up to 650 megs. And by 1994, multiple companies, including Connor and HP, were selling jukeboxes that worked exactly like the CD variety, but with the advantage that the discs weren't just writable or even rewritable, but random access rewritable. Just like CDRWs, after writing to an MO disk, you have to erase it before you can write new data. But the disks have hard sectors, which allow a drive to erase just one chunk of data at a time and rewrite only that block. So effectively, they could be treated like big, slow, floppy disks, very similar to the DVD-RAM format that came out a decade later. Now, this is huge. As a business, you'd much rather do incremental daily backups rather than wait a week or a month before you can run off a new disc to avoid wasting blank media at a time when CD blanks still cost significant money. So for this and other reasons, as I understand it, MO jukeboxes did have significant uptake. And in fact, a decade later, I found that there was a medium none of us has probably heard of that was basically created to replace it and may have succeeded. Not that anyone would know unless you worked for a huge health insurance company or something. That format was called UDO. It was based on the same technology as Blu-ray, although it came out a year or two before that hit the market. It could store a little bit more data, about 30 gigs per disc, and it was sold in cartridges identical to Magneto Optical. I'd guess that was so you could upgrade your library in place from MO to UDO by just swapping out the readers and the discs, rather than throwing out a huge piece of data center furniture. Whether that actually happened, given the plummeting costs of hard drives and LTO tape, I couldn't tell you for sure, but the drives in the media, you can buy them on eBay for pretty reasonable prices, so I'm gonna go ahead and guess this had some uptake. So, to sum up, optical libraries started out with a few very special use cases, and then those started dropping like flies over just the next few years, but some of those functions stuck around at least into the mid-2000s, just not in places most of us ever would have seen them. Towards the end of this whole process, however, something interesting happened. Optical libraries actually became available to consumers. I mean, okay. <laughs> By this point, a number of people have gone, hey, wait, I had a 100 disc CD changer in the 90s. These have always been around. And yes, that is literally a CD jukebox. But to my knowledge, none of those things supported data disks. You couldn't plug them into your PC. 
If you know otherwise, please get in touch. I'd love to see a machine that could do that. But as far as I know, all those changers could only play audio. Likewise, the DVD and Blu-ray versions that came out in the 2000s could only play movies. And probably nobody minded that because, once again, consumers just never had much need for massive collections of data discs. And so, when DVD, the next major optical format, dropped in 1996, most people didn't get excited about it as a data format, even though it was like rolling back the clock to the early 90s. Once again, DVDs stored 7 to 14 times more data than CDs, and once again, they held a couple times more data than the average consumer hard drive. But the average person, and even most exceptional people, still weren't doing anything that produced more than a few megs of output. And on top of that, DVDs didn't even replace CDs for software distribution. Most programs still came on CD-ROM right up until optical drives disappeared from computers entirely. So DVD as a data format was even less relevant than CD-ROM had been. People still didn't have a need to rack up hundreds of discs for immediate access. But you know what came on DVD that people did want to do that with? movies. People built massive collections of DVDs immediately. Like The format kicked off an era of media consumption that I feel made VHS pale in comparison. Folks might have had some big tape collections in the 90s, but it feels like by 2001 you could throw a rock and hit someone's room-filling DVD library. There were so many people watching movies every day, just binging them for hours, you can imagine some of them wished they could just load up all the movies. Every. Single. One. All. At once. And you could do that with the PowerFile C200, but you probably wouldn't want to because it's a big piece of shit. I mean, to be clear, it might not be possible to build something like this that isn't a big piece of shit, but I poured hours into getting this one working and now I think it's a kind of torment nexus, a device that exists to bring only pain, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The PowerFile is another optical jukebox and a much newer one. It was made in the year 2000 and it cost a bit under 2000. It's an enormous and entirely plain metal box. I mean, even compared to most AV center components, this thing is basic. The back has some Firewire ports, which was more in vogue by this point than SCSI, and then there's a power plug. That's it. The top tells a story of a machine that's been treated pretty poorly in its twilight years, but also shows off the Firewire logo stamped into the metal, which is a pretty strange branding decision if you ask me. But this kind of machine doesn't need to look flashy because its value is all about what it can do. It has not one, but two DVD readers inside and a capacity of 200 discs. So yeah, an awful lot of people could fit their whole movie collection into one of these, plus all 10 seasons of The Simpsons and still have room to spare. I was sad to learn, actually, that there were over 3,000 movies on DVD by the year 2000, because that means I can't make a joke about loading every DVD in existence into this thing. But you could make some inroads. These can daisy chain up to at least three units, and that's 600 discs, or about 900 hours of entertainment. And I don't see why you couldn't plug another three machine chain into your max second Firewire port to get 1,200 discs, or around 1,800 hours of video, at which point your local blockbuster would probably be posting guys outside in white vans to keep an eye on you. This is an incredible volume of media on its face, but the theoretical data capacity here is really absurd if you do the math, and it remained that way for much longer than you might expect. A DVD stores at least 4.7 gigs, so the minimum capacity of just one of these libraries is close to a terabyte at a time when hard drives stored less than 30 gigs on average. Most of us didn't even have terabyte hard drives a decade later, so this is pretty remarkable. But we're back to the early CD-ROM days again. If you were interested in DVD for its data capacity, that barely matters because this machine is only for consuming. Unless you got the PowerFile R200, which came with a pair of DVD burners. <laughs> this almost seems absurd. I mean, there are bulk disc burning systems out there, of course, but usually you want the discs to go in a little pile when they're done so you can put them in envelopes, not just stay inside the burner until you manually eject them, which is what you'd have to do with this. But imagine if you were a photographer, for instance. Every time you do a shoot, you could put a fresh disc in the machine, burn your photos to it, and just leave it in there. And now they're all safely archived, but they're available at a moment's notice, and you can pull one out and take it with you if need be. You have a physical embodiment of your digital portfolio sitting right next to your desk. Same deal, if you're a videographer, you could run off DVDs of every finished product. That's a pretty cool idea. 
Curiously though, the manual says nothing about burning ordinary CDs or DVDs. It only mentions the DVD RAM format. That's odd, and I don't know if it's actually a limitation, but you know, let's roll with it because that's even cooler. DVD RAM disks basically functioned like slow flash drives. A 5.2 gig RAM disk cost about $40 in the year 2000, so if this was the R model, what I'd have here would be 1,040 gigs of removable random access storage for about eight grand, which sounds like a lot, but gig for gig and not counting the cost of the power file itself, it was still cheaper than most hard drives. Plus, you didn't have to fill the whole thing at once when you bought it. You could start out with just one disk, then buy new ones as you filled them up. And at any time, you could pull out any five gig chunk of data and just take it with you. In other words, this was the home gamer version of the Enterprise Magneto Optical Library, which is pretty wild for a consumer product. Whether you were a pathological movie buff or a data hoarder, this thing was pretty cool. Trouble is, there's a lot of parts of it that just suck. For instance, the local UI is awkward as hell. Uh, like all other jukeboxes, it's meant to be operated via software, but there is a screen and some buttons on the front and you do unfortunately need to interact with them from time to time. The buttons are really unpleasant to press and the screen is incredibly hard to see because it's mounted inside the case. You have to look at it through the atomic purple acrylic for some reason. Why? Why do this? The front is also rounded, so as you can see, it's virtually impossible to prevent glare. When I was getting a, a close-up of this, I had to stick some gaff tape to the table just to film it clearly. There's also some awkwardness with how it handles media, and to explain that, we should probably take a look at the insides. Unfortunately, the manufacturer didn't put this thing in a clear acrylic case. I think they missed a bet there because it actually looks pretty awesome. The metal shroud comes off with eight screws. Then there's a plastic cover inside that just helps keep the discs in place, I guess. And there we have the machine. This carousel holds all the discs, of course. That's really the only practical way to build one of these. The two drives live in the middle, facing in opposite directions. And when you pick a disc, it rotates the carousel around and a robot arm pushes it into the drive where it gets read like normal. First, however, you naturally have to get the discs into the machine. This is also awkward. This is a mail slot type machine, so you have to load discs one at a time. You hit load, you wait for the door to open, you press the disc gently into the slot and wait for the robot arm inside to pull it in. You can't just drop the whole disc in there and you can't let go of it. You have to wait with your hand on the disc until it takes it from you. And to fill this machine, you of course have to do this 200 times. Insert, wait, insert, wait, and so on, and every time takes like eight to 10 seconds. Fortunately, this would only really be a frustration when you're initially setting it up, but still, it would have been a lot nicer if you could just open the top and drop the discs into the slots. Other than loading and unloading, everything else is done from your PC, or let's be realistic here, your Mac. Look at this thing, it's obviously meant for Apple hardware. And that is my advice anyway, since the Mac software actually works. The original PC app was reportedly horrible and has been lost to time, probably to everyone's benefit. Media Finder X lets you see the status of all connected changers and drives and the inventory of disks in each one. You can select a disk and hit mount and the machine will put it into a drive. Once it's loaded, the icon appears on the desktop and you can use it like normal. So if I wanna watch Animaniacs, I just click on the name, the carousel leaps into action, and a few seconds later, there it is on my desktop and I can fire it right up in iDVD. Honestly, unironically, this would have been a film buff's dream in 2000. You just ask for a movie and it comes right to you. But obviously with 200 discs, you don't want them all on the desktop. Fortunately, it only displays the discs that are actually in drives. The rest of your inventory appears in the manager app and as virtual directories inside a folder on your desktop. Here we can see all the disks and their titles. The software caches the metadata on all the disks in the machine. And in fact, if they are data disks, which it does of course support, you can poke around and look at their contents without making the machine do any work. The file names and sizes are cached, so it only actually changes disks once you try to read a file. Of course, all of this requires the jukebox knows what disks are where. The missile knows where it is at all times. It knows this because it knows where it isn't. The machine keeps track of what's in each of the internal slots. And if you load a bunch of disks at once, as soon as the jukebox has a chance, it'll start loading each of those disks into whatever drive isn't in use so it can scan the label and its contents. It's very clever when it works. When I was shooting B-roll for this video, I spent about two hours fighting with the software because it would load, unload, and mount disks, but it wouldn't index them. I have no idea why, it's an automatic process. I switched machines and it started working, running the same software and OS on both machines. Makes no sense. 
Then once I started loading it, I ran into more problems. The bulk load process worked normally for about 40 disks, and then it started fighting me. It would load one disk, and then immediately begin trying to start the index process. So I'd hit the stop button a couple times before it would listen to me, and then it would let me load just one disk and then start the index process again. Bulk load. No. Bad. Bad. Stop. Bad dog. Bad dog. Stop. Stop identifying. Quit it. On top of that, once it finished indexing, most of the disks didn't show up in the changer folder until I rebooted the machine, which is just bizarre. How does that happen? I also ran into straight up firmware issues. At first I was testing this on Windows and the thing just wouldn't play ball. I mean, it was working, but I'd issue a few simple commands and then it'd get confused. It would start thinking there were no disks in the drives even when there were. Before long, the whole thing was unusable. I thought this was just because the software sucked. So I switched to the Mac and it looked so much nicer and more professional. And then five minutes later, I had it jammed up again, just by trying to load and unload disks a little bit more quickly than expected. So the firmware seems very fragile and unlike a laser jet printer, when this thing jams, it's hell on earth to unjam. It turns out there are no sensors on the disk slots to see if they actually contain disks. I certainly didn't expect them on every slot, but it seems like this machine doesn't have any at all. It just remembers that you put a disk in when slot 10 was open and then assumes it's in slot 10 forever. If it's wrong, there's no easy way to override it. And I couldn't find an option to just scan every slot and find out which ones are empty. Several times I got it into a state where it didn't understand which slots were actually occupied and fixing that was miserable. I had to figure out how to get it into service mode. It turns out you have to enter the Konami code basically, right, right, left, right, right on the keypad. Then you can tell it to force eject the drives and then dump changer, which makes it eject every single disk. This takes forever because it wants to rotate to each slot, then perform the whole eject sequence four times. Why four would work when one didn't is anyone's guess. Even after that, it was still pretty confused. I had to factory reset it, then spend an hour removing all the disks by hand, factory it again, reload the disks one at a time to get it back to a usable state. During this whole process, I had to open the machine up, and as I poked around the innards, I just got this very strong feeling that the thing was not very well built. It, it almost feels like a hobbyist made it. It feels like it should be a big 3D printed open source hardware project. Everything seems very simple and rudimentary, like they made it out of off the shelf components. They didn't though, they're all custom parts. They're just cheap and crappy. So it's no surprise the firmware didn't get as much attention as it deserved either. To be fair, maybe this thing is tired. Maybe it doesn't work as well as it did when it was new, but I don't really believe that because this is just the fate of consumer robotics mechanisms. Think about printers, for instance. Those have perennially had problems with their internal state getting out of sync with reality. That's after decades of refinement. Anything without that much effort behind it is doomed to run into sequencing errors. And this machine in particular just doesn't have enough sensors and doesn't question its assumptions enough to prevent that. When it is working, it's pretty cool. When it's identifying new disks, for instance, it really gets going. It's rotating the turntable back and forth, loading and unloading DVDs, and then the names are popping up in the software as it slowly populates everything. It looks super cool. I'm not entirely sure who the company marketed this thing to. I don't actually think many people wanted a 200 disk DVD player to use at home only connected to their computer. But if consumer sales were on their radar, I really think they should have sold a clear case version. It's delightfully distracting to watch it doing its thing. When it is behaving, it works exactly like you'd hope with very few limitations. I wasn't able to fully test this since as it turns out, iDVD is an incredibly limited app. I couldn't even find a way to pick which drive to play from. But I'm positive that if you had better player software and you were Todd from Akewood, you could genuinely watch two movies at once. But that is just when it's working. I couldn't find much contemporary chatter about these things, but I imagine anyone who owned one spent less time watching movies than they did cursing at the machine. So to go back to our earlier topic, I was bummed that I wasn't able to get a hold of one of those enterprise CD-ROM jukeboxes with the hundreds of discs and the big robot arm. But I have to wonder if we didn't just see a preview of what those machines were like. An exaggeration maybe, but I imagine there's some truth to it. Since they were targeted at businesses, I'm sure they were built more right, more sensors, better firmware. But my gut still says that if you were in charge of feeding and caring for a fleet of disc changers, no matter how much they cost, they probably spent more time out of service than in. It's just hard to make something like this that works without getting itself confused. 
And if you were a user of those systems, even when they worked, I have to imagine you spent an awful lot of your time just waiting waiting for it to switch disks, waiting for your time slot to come up when contending with 40 other users, and waiting for your data to copy off a CD-ROM that was, after all, probably a lot slower than the hard drive you were used to. So like I said at the beginning of this video, I don't really know what I'm talking about here. There was so little info available that most of this is just speculation or reading between the lines, but I get the impression that these things were never a whole lot of fun to use. I found them intriguing enough to spend a fortune having them shipped here, but I think I'll have no trouble getting rid of them, and I won't be mourning this industry either. Instead, I'm just going to count my blessings that we got to where we are, a place where a device that fits in a shirt pocket can store more than twice as much data as this whole 200-disc library for a fraction of the cost and with a lot less waiting. But if you disagree, if you remember these things being good, then leave a comment. Uh, I'll welcome your recollections and corrections, but otherwise, that's all I've got. I can finally get these things out of my studio. They've been here for a year and they haven't paid a dime in rent. If you enjoyed this video though, please subscribe so I know you're into this sort of thing. And remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new stuff, like follow-ups to videos that I said I'd deliver a year ago. But if you really enjoyed this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people are doing here. That's how I get the money to buy dumb stuff like this over and over until I get one that works, only to find out it's super boring anyway. It's also how I pay my rent and buy groceries, so, you know, maybe that gets you more excited. Either way, I couldn't afford to do anything I'm doing without the help of these folks. I'm so grateful to everyone who's supporting me. Thank you all so much, and everyone else, thanks for watching.